Thank you for joining us, everyone. I am Renee Bodie, the General Manager for Soka Performing Arts Center, which sits on the indigenous lands of the Ahachiman people. My preferred pronouns are she, her. Before we begin, this evening's guest speaker, Andrew Jans, has requested to open our program by sharing with you all one of his favorite cello pieces, one that he and other Project Music Heals Us musicians have been performing this past year to provide calm and comfort for rehabilitating COVID patients in hospitals across the country. Beautiful, Andrew, just beautiful. Thank you for joining us for our conversation with Andrew Jantz, Executive Director of Project Music Heals Us, a nonprofit organization that aims to democratize access to the healing potential of compassionate human connection through live arts performance, creation, and learning. Since its founding in 2014, PMHU has presented over 1,000 free concerts and educational programs in hospitals, correctional facilities, shelters, and refugee centers in programs all over the country. In the midst of COVID-19, PMHU launched the Vital Sounds Initiative, providing over $100,000 in musician, musician support to artists, arts, art to, to various artists and arts uh, programmers across the country um, to provide live one-on-one -on -one digital bedside concerts to isolated hospital patients across the country. The initiative addresses two concurrent courses of desperation affecting two seemingly unrelated groups, isolated COVID patients and their caregivers and performing artists who have had their livelihoods threatened by the shutdown of the arts programming. As a professional cellist, Andrew has collaborated in concert with a long list of iconic classical artists, including Itzhak Perlman, Pincus Zuckerman, and Leon Fleischer, as well as chart-topping performers such as Bruce Springsteen, Lana Del Rey, 
and Mary J. Blige, among others. Andrew was the founding cellist of both the Solera Quartet and the Escher Quartet, and presently tours and records with the brown breaking cello rock band Break of Reality, both in the United States and as cultural ambassadors for the US Department of State. I have known Andrew for many years and he is a remarkable individual. Please join us in welcoming Andrew Jantz. Andrew, you have been involved with PMHU for many years now, but it seems like this has been a breakout year for the organization in terms of people hearing about the work you do that largely happens out of the public eye with coverage by the New York Times and the Yo-Yo Ma's recent involvement in your programs. Um, first of all, I thank you so much for having me, Renee. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I am a, a cellist and a nonprofit administrator, and I am not a videographer. Um, so my, my apologies on my end um, for the cut out of the video. Um, I am very excited about my new DSLR setup, but apparently I still have more to learn. Um, yeah, PMHU, um, for the first many years of its existence, existed to do only live in-person uh, performing arts in places that didn't have access to it, um, be it um, hospitals, nursing homes, food, food pantries, shelters. Um, it was the brainchild of, of a woman named Molly Carr, a violist and, and my co-director at the, the organization, um, who in, in a, a time of her desperation, and, and I think we can get into that a little later probably, but um, founded this organization with, with the intent of reaching people who had no live access to the arts. Um, I, my involvement began um, back, actually at the very, very first concert that she gave, um, she, she asked me to be a part of the organization um, as a cellist, not, not as a, a part of the organization working with it, but, but just playing for a concert. Um, and I was so moved by what she, what she had created, even at that first um, intervention that it was, it was already on my mind to, to see how I could get more involved. Beautiful. Um, and now were you going to show us a, a clip of your, in, of what she is doing? Absolutely. So this, this year, um, right around this time last year, actually, it, there was this week and, and it's going to be a famous week for a long time with all live performing artists where um, the first cancellation rolled in saying we just don't know if we can have this concert live in person this this virus is seems kind of serious um, and and then after that first one then they just started rolling in and before before you knew it just about every performing artist I knew had their entire season wiped out um, and as as every other organization did, we tried to pivot to online um, offerings. Our work, because of its kind of non-public facing nature, didn't really translate well to online large live streaming platforms. Um, Zoom concerts just didn't feel appropriate. So we decided to take a different route. Um, we decided to try and get even more personalized with our, our programming. So we started doing live digital one-on-one -on -one concerts between the musicians who we'd already had contracted for the year. None of us on our board or our executive team felt right about, you know, saving money on the, the backs of performing artists by, by using these force majeure clauses. Um, so these artists started playing concerts first into New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, it's the Allen Hospital is the very tip of Manhattan. For those of you who don't know, Manhattan goes way, way above Times Square and almost all the way to the Bronx, there's a small hospital where I had a friend who is a doctor um, working in a COVID unit. And um, she'll, I'll, I'll let her explain, but at, at, at that hospital, it just so happened that while we were giving these concerts, the New York Times was in the building reporting on a different story. They heard about our program and decided to run a piece about it. Um, and alongside that article, they produced a five minute video, which was just so beautiful um, and, and was such a blessing to us because of most, most of our work was so out of the public eye, um, there was very little to show for it. So this New York Times piece was, was really a game changer for us. And we just, for, for those of you, since we're talking to an audience on the West Coast and we're talking about the New York Times, um, I'm, I'm assuming that most people haven't had a chance to see it, but I'd love to share with you about a minute of that, that clip. 
That'd be great. I think a lot of doctors that I've talked to have expressed the same sentiment that we aren't helping enough. There's a pianist, a violist, and a cellist that are in the same place. And there's a cellist on the West Coast. And they actually already had sort of a project going on where they play for more vulnerable populations and were very interested in helping with the patients that I was seeing. I just had this phone call with Rachel. She mentioned that wouldn't it be incredible if, if the COVID patients who were more isolated from their family and friends than ever could experience this. FaceTime concerts for COVID patients. And it, it suddenly clicked that we could provide that. Hey guys, thank you so much. How are you? We get a call from Rachel on FaceTime. I'm going to put the um, phone down like on the table and then you guys can go, okay? Okay. Okay, great. great. Thank you. And she says, okay guys, you're on, and just, we play. It's not silence on the other side of the call. It's a lot of noise. It's a lot of beeping from the machines. Typically you can hear the ventilator breathing for the patient. It takes us in a way like, boom, we're right in the front lines. This is how we can hold their hands right now. It's blue music. Every time we get off the phone, there's a bit of um, a different atmosphere in this house. So that's... That's the gist of what we've been doing for the last year. Um, that, that program, which began in one hospital in Northern Manhattan, because of that piece and because of the work of the musicians who are involved in the program, um, is now in 23 hospitals across the country. Um, there have been 190 musicians involved playing these concerts. Um, as, as COVID has waxed and waned, um, we've realized that um, we, we've learned that there's always been isolation issues in, in hospitals and there are groups around the, the country who have already been working on this tirelessly for, for decades. Um, and now we're able to give these virtual concerts for people who, who have other reasons for not being able to, to see friends, families have contagion issues with their doctors. Um, it's, it's opening up an entire new world of, of patient care um, that has up until now been largely unaddressable. Um, so we, we feel we feel very very um, grateful that that during this pandemic year um, we've been given this chance to do something that which we feel has been meaningful and, and has a, a bright future and offering um, a, a source of employment for musicians as well something for them to do which is you know with with shuttered venues they've lost a lot of that ability to do their art in yeah. front of live live audiences so. I mean. <laughs> even even more than the money you know it's like performing artists and and i would i think it's safe to say many of many of of them um and us and me uh, you know have, are used to having long dry spells of of no no work and and low low employment but to to have the the ability to actually connect with other human beings, the actual reason we got into the performing arts, to have that taken away where now you all of this practice you've done for decades and, and all of your the soul you've put into it, now there's just no outlet for it. You're just playing to yourself in a mirror and trying to keep your chops up for why, like for what reason. Um, so we've heard time and time again from these artists, uh, not only like, thank you for giving me an outlet to actually feel like I'm, I'm doing something with my art, but also like, these concerts, these one-on-one -on -one concerts, like these are some of the most personal concerts I've ever given. Like it's, you know, it's one thing to play for 3000 people at Carnegie Hall. It's another to play for someone's face who you know is going through the hardest time in their life um, and try and use your art to, to bring them some solace and some, some healing. Yeah, what an incredible story. It's amazing. It's amazing what you're doing. So tell me a little bit about how, or tell our audience a little bit about how Project Music Heals Us began, the concept. 
Yeah, so I touched on this a little bit um, at the beginning, kind of out of order, but um, Project Music Heals Us was started by a woman named Molly Carr. Um, she's a violist, an old friend of mine. I've known her since um, we were both in undergrad at the Manhattan School of Music. Um, Molly has just one of the, like the heart doesn't fit in, in the body. And she, uh, she had a year which was kind of existential for her. She was washing dishes um, as you do and a wine glass broke and uh, micro shards of glass got stuck right here on this pad and this finger, um, which for anybody would be annoying, but for a professional violist, every time she vibrated, um, just searing pain shot down. And so she was faced, you know, this, this woman who's put her entire life into to being a violist um, with the prospect of, of never being able to play again. Um, and that, that kind of, um, yeah, identity crisis led to her looking to, all right, well, what else can I do with, with this need I have to connect with people um, that led her to seeing um, nursing aides caring for her grandparents and, and seeing how much she respected the work that they did caring for people in need. I mean, she thought she would try her hand at nursing. So there was a, a course with the American Red Cross, a nursing aid course, which she signed up for. Um, and she ended up doing a residency in a nursing home and in that nursing home, uh, befriending a late stage Alzheimer's patient named Ruth, who um, from everything I hear and saw ultimately was not getting um, the kind of personal care that, that you know, she, she needed uh, with, with her ailment. Um, everybody was, you know, un understandably um, found it very difficult to care for someone who, whose main, um, main mode of, of contact was, was painful screaming because she was just in constant, you know, distress. But Molly um, took the time to, to sit down with her and hold her hand. And apparently it, it led to a conversation about, well, where are you from? And are you with the American Red Cross? And, and all of this very simple conversation, but, but that led, led you to know, like, she's still there and she still needs people. And she, so Molly, at the end of this residency, promised her that, you know, should she ever be able to get back to this alternate universe where she's a professional, you know, concert world traveling violist that she wanted to bring her and her friends back to play. And lo and behold, six months later, the first Project Music Heals Us uh, concert was at Ruth's bedside um, at the, the home. And so I, I was lucky enough to be involved again, just as a cellist at that point, but um, to see, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a second to talk about that concert because you know, Ruth was having a really hard day that, that first day. Um, we played for a kind of general population of, of the, the home and Ruth wasn't there. And Molly asked, you know, is, is Ruth okay? And she said, no, they're having, a, she's having a really hard day. Um, but they allowed us to actually go to a room and this quintet of people surrounding the bed. Um, and, you know, Ruth was just in this, this kind of state and we started playing. Um, and <laughs> after about the first, you know, 10 or 20 seconds, you just saw. <laughs> and then, you know, and then, and by the end, it was just this kind of like re release. It was just, you know, it's, it's, we, we hesitate to, to say that music is like medically healing, but in that, in that case, it was so relieving to, to this woman in distress that, um, you know, I, I think it was more powerful than any drug they could have given her at the, at the moment. Um, so that was that was the seed of how I I got involved. Um, I just saw what Molly was doing with Project Music Heals Us from the beginning, and and um, I think the the seed was laying for me to want to be more and more involved. Um, yeah. Right from then. That's beautiful. Yes, you know, music as the best medicine is incredible. I mean, that was what a story. So that just kind of drew you in back into you just kept doing more of these is that and that's how your involvement kind of well, solid I yeah I, I'd love to say that right from that I knew that I was gonna be be involved but I actually the the act the real the real story is that I was already working in arts administration along with being a cellist and and when Molly decided to start Project Music Heals as she she asked me it's like hey uh, you've been doing this for a while do you, do you have any advice for me um and I said, "Oh, absolutely! Uh, yeah, don't do that. Don't don't start a nonprofit. What are you thinking? Like, what's are you crazy?" Um, and and you know, it was it was good advice to ninety nine percent of the population who have no idea what they're getting into. But but Molly heard that and and just doubled down. Um, 
and I started to see her do this work. And, and I started to look at, at the work I was doing, which was much more kind of traditional concert presenting. Um, and and I, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't a little bit jealous at the, the notion that, that the, all of these hours of work that, that all of us in arts administration put in um, couldn't be directed a little bit more towards, towards kind of like palpably healing um, and, and, and necessary work. Um, so I, I actually, a couple of years later, came, came to Molly as I saw her kind of, you know, just, just raising money for each concert as it came. You know, when, when you start a nonprofit, like you don't have backing, you don't have like big grants or deep pocket donors. Um, she was paying for each, each individual concert as they came. And um, I, I just offered to, to use the, the few skills I had built up to, to throw the first kind of large event. Um, and we, we threw that event and it was successful enough that we were actually able to kind of step back and start doing a little bit more long-term planning for the organization. And I think that that first event um, and, and how we worked together on it kind of laid the foundation for us to now actually run the organization together. Um, and yeah, we, we haven't looked back. Wow. So now that you've created this wonderful nonprofit, tell us a little bit about how it lives out its mission in the various programs. So pre-pandemic, pre pre um, as I said, all of, all of PMHU's programming was live in person for populations who did not have access to the arts. And one of the kind of byproducts is that is that a lot of the people who do not have access to the arts are in places where you, they don't necessarily want like a lot of PR. Like you don't, you, don't, you know, if you're in a hospital, there are HIPAA regulations. If you're in a shelter, very obvious reasons for privacy. Um, so this was this was a, a labor of love. Um, all, all of these programs, um, we, we tried to design programs that had both just gorgeous music and also a message that people could kind of take with them. All of the concerts were, were very interactive. We didn't wanna just go in and play music at people and that's what you get and now we're gone. Um, a lot of it was kind of telling telling people what we loved about this music and trying to glean what they loved about their favorite music and where the inner where the interlap was. Um, so it started in in nursing homes, hospitals, all these places, um, and then Molly had from the very very beginning um, always wanted to start a a prison outreach branch. Um, she she had her own reasons for wanting to do that, um, but it took a number of years. It took it took years of cold calling, and a lot of no's and a lot of like, I'm sorry, who are you again? Um, before one one institution and especially one person opened the door for us to do our first prison outreach uh, program, and that that program happened at the Corrigan Redgowski um, prison in Uncasville, uh, Connecticut, and. We had no idea how it would be received. You know, we were bringing classical music at that time. We were a purely classical music organization. It's changed a little bit since then, but um, we had no idea how it would be received. It's not, you know, it's not the most popular genre among uh, you know, anybody, let alone correctional institution populations. Um, but we were really, really heartened to. At the first concert, about eighty people came in and listened to our concert, and and. We, we, there was a lot of dialogue and back and forth. And, and at the end of it, we were like, wow, it was really, I can't believe that many people came. And it was only after that, that somebody explained to us that um, it had been raining the entire time that we were um, <laughs> performing and they had two, two options to go stand in the rain or come listen to a concert. Um, but that, that first concert already started um, the progression of us meeting individuals who we would see from time to time again. And, and at that particular concert, there was a man who was facilitating the concert. He was, he was an inmate who was, his job was to set out the chairs and make and like try and recruit people. And he, he came and he told us um, right after the concert, he said, uh, you know, I, I thought that this was gonna be like, you know, hour of elevator music, I'd get a nice nap, you know, whatever. Um, but one of the violinists who we were working with that day, she was talking about, uh, it was a late Beethoven string quartet. The, for us, like the, the holy Bible of, of chamber music. Um, and she said, you know, there's no right way to 
process this music. If you if you have an existential moment, that's correct. If you if you are like just feeling very very relaxed by it, also correct. Um, and she said, if you want to, if you feel like you want to close your eyes and just take it in kind of half, half conscious, like we do that too as musicians. And so bringing it back to this, this man talking to us afterwards, he, he said, you know, when, when he said that, um, you know, we don't usually close our eyes in large groups of people in here. Like, it's just not something you do like from a safety standpoint, but I looked over and the guy I kind of had my eye on, he had his eyes closed. So I did it. Um, and man, it, it took me, it took me out of this place for a moment. And, and that was, that was the first concert we ever did. And, and there have been stories like that kind of every step of the way. And so we started with these single day, um, music interventions, um, is, is the, the term that we use across the, the, the branches of the organization. Um, but we, we kind of immediately started thinking like, well, well, this was so powerful in this one day. What if we could, what if we stayed, what if we could do more, um, and so from those single day interventions, we, we conceived of and, and started giving five day kind of intensive compositional sessions. Um, and so the, what that allowed is for us to bring in both instrumental musicians and the teaching artist to start these guys, not only listening and kind of processing the music, but also creating their own music and giving them a creative and positive emotional outlet for whatever they're going through. And we don't spend a lot of time like trying to pry into anybody's anything. Just creating music is such a personal thing. Um, it's for you, it's for the person who's doing it. Um, and so we, we started doing these, these uh, workshops and you wouldn't believe some of the, like the creative output. It was, you know, no, nobody's writing a Mozart string quartet after five days of, of whatever. It's like, it's not what people write these days. And also you can't teach music composition in five days, but from the seeds of like rhythmic rhythmic lessons and harmonic kind of intro to harmony and writing melodies. Um, some of the pieces that came out of it were just so interesting, just, just objectively like interesting. There was a, a man named Matt who, he was able to write a number of melodies and kind of musical um, moments. And then he was a poet more than anything else. So he wrote a poem about his childhood and then each trigger word within the poem. So there was a trigger word of mother. And when he got to the word mother, one of the, the violinists started playing crunchy, crunchy peanut butter, because that was a, a musical montage to mom. And then there's a, a moment where he's talking about running and, and there's this shh, 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 shh. And it became this kind of poetic musical montage over the course of the work. And it was just like, it was so interesting. It was, it was not anything that we've studied in classical conservatory. And I'm not sure it's anything that, that I've seen exist outside of that particular workshop, but it was just, yeah. So it's, it's these, these programs have, have gotten us thinking, what if, what if we could expand even, even farther and start these year long programs. And the year long program was where we were when the pandemic hit. Um, there, there is, there is a, um, film that is coming out later this year. Um, it was the brainchild of a man named Chris Giro, who's an incredible documentarian, a nine time Emmy award winning, um, documentarian. And they, they actually chose Project Music Heals as, as, as part of their, their movie about music during the pandemic and how it connects people and how it, it brings people together. And we were, we were so fortunate to have their team come and um, try and capture what, what we've been doing. Um, and I wanted to share with the audience um, a slightly longer clip than I would usually share in a, a webinar, just because um, you know these things are supposed to be about live, live interviews. But within this clip, there's an actual full piece of, of one of the inmate participants, a man named um, Corey Satterfield. And usually we don't say their full names, but he, um, he's actually a man who got out of prison, got off parole and started coming to our live concerts. Um, and Corey, like we're friends on Facebook now. He's, he's awesome. He, he came to a concert where the Reverend from the prison was also there as an attendee and they saw themselves in, in plain clothes for the first time. And it was just one of these mind bending moments. Um, but it, this, this clip covers Corey's, um, uh, kind of journey through this this short but very intense moment so um 
with your with your permission, I'll share. Sure. Excellent. We would go in every day for four hours, and that allows us to start doing composition programs where if you've never touched a piano, you've still heard a tune in your head, and getting that tune out of your head and onto paper to accentuate what you're feeling. You're heartbroken. You miss your wives, your girlfriends. You miss your family, your kids. I lost loved ones when I was in jail. My grandmother passed when I was in jail. I had my sister pass away. I had one sister. She was it. He took that and wanted us to play something that would draw out the sadness of losing his sister. Each of us was asked, they said that we get an opportunity to create a piece of music. And I really started diving into it and trying to arrange a piece of music or get instruments to play together in my head. And we had gotten a rough draft done. They played it once for me, rushed in the room. One of the most amazing moments of my life. so good <laughs> sounds great oh, that was the first time in my life since my sister died in any regard that i had openly said anything to that magnitude that i had lost someone it's through music that people are able to express things that maybe they thought were shameful or maybe they thought were too private and that moment where you make yourself vulnerable and it's not met with ridicule, but it's met with support and positivity. Like that is a moment when people can really kind of realize there's a group here that is willing to be with me in whatever we're going through together. And before you know it, you have an entire group of people who is supporting one another. To take something that's so raw out of yourself and put it down into something that's literally like, hey, this is, this is my hurt, this is my sorrow, this is my pain, this is what I feel, and this is what it was for me, and it was great. I mean, to me, that's redemption. That's, that's some sort of connection to something deeper inside a human being that I don't get to witness that often. And here I am, of all places, in a jail housing unit, and that happens. The power of music, it's right there. So the, the man who, um, right at the end, who uh, earlier in the, the, the clip, he gets uh, introduced, that's uh, Tommy Demenkoff, who is the director of fine and performing arts uh, for all the New York City uh, Department of Corrections jails and their, their jail, of, yeah, a lot of jails in New York City. Um, and he, he's, that man is gonna be sainted someday. Like the, he, he is truly 
I mean, if, if we work, if we work outside of the public eye, he works outside of any eye whatsoever. Um, but he, he's he's just incredible. Um, wow. So yeah, those uh, I, we we just feel we when when we get to hear the the feedback from people like Corey, and again, like we we don't often get to hear from our our participants because there's just not a lot of ability for people to to reach out. Um, it it really inspires us to keep going and try and build these programs into even even kind of more deep and long and intensive experiences. Um, that that documentary clip, that was about four minutes of, of a 15 minute clip um, that that PMHU is part of in, in this documentary. We actually have been given permission to do a sneak preview of this, the full the full session at a concert that um, Project Music Heals Us will be presenting um, on April 25th, the live stream at 4 p.m. on, on the 25th. Um, and we would we would love to invite everyone on this this webinar to to uh, join. It'll be uh, myself um, and a pianist named Audrey Vardaniga, who is one of the first pianists on the Vital Sounds um, initiative. Uh, probably we the second pianist we had on that on that that program. Um, she and I will be playing a, a cello piano recital, and we'll be showing the full the full clip. We will put that link in the follow-up email that is going to also retain uh, contain the recording to this um, webinar. So we'll make sure people are aware of how to sign up for that if they'd like. And I think it's also in the chat. But you brought up a, the Vital Sounds Initiative, and it's something that I'd love for you to talk about, because I know that Yo-Yo Ma has become involved with this uh, this program of Project Music Heals Us. And I wanted to you to talk a little bit about that and Yo-Yo's involvement. So yeah, I mean, I'm 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 a cellist. So for me, like the the moment that you get an email like, "Hey, Yo Yo Ma wants to play concerts for your organization," um, I you know, it's just been a year of of a lot of setbacks, but also just some of the most incredible connections that we've we've ha been able to fathom. And and I know that a, a lot of musicians are coming out of this year hurting um but almost every single one of them uh, that i know has had this moment where where they realize like wow this has been an incredibly clarifying year for me about what i want to be doing um and how do i transition back to yo-yo <laughs> um so we we were giving these concerts and the new york times piece came out and we we had about I want to say like 10 days before we, between when we found out that they were going to write the piece and when the piece actually ran. Um, and in that time, there's just a, an a, immense amount of fact checking and, and you know, um, all of that. So we had a little bit of time to conceive of, okay, we thought this was just going to be a program in one hospital there is going to be a, a flood of, of interest likely in having this roll out. And so we were able to, to build the, the program as best we could um, with the notion of how do we create kind of a turnkey program where this rubric at New York Presbyterian can work anywhere that has a healthcare worker who is, who is interested, a musician who is interested and patients who are isolated, which is just about everywhere. Um, after the, the piece ran, I want to say about a month afterwards, a woman named Lisa Wong, who is a physician in Boston and also a musician herself and uh, almost more than anything, a connector of people. Um, she went to, I believe she went to Harvard with, with Yo-Yo back in the day. Um, and she reached out saying, you know, you, you wouldn't believe this, but Yo-Yo Ma is um, also sitting at home like every other musician wondering um, how he can how he can make the world slightly less painful right now with with his talents. He heard about your program and he would like to participate if you have a place for him. Um, and that last that last like yes, if you have a place for him. Um, yeah, we thought about it for about a trillionth of a second, and um, and then and then within I'd say a couple weeks, um, he was playing for patients in New York Presbyterian at the original. Um, yeah, area of a hospital name called uh, Wyckoff Heights in Brooklyn, um, and also Houston Methodist, um, which has actually an entire Center for Performing Arts Medicine um, wing, kind of an incredible institution um, that focuses both on 
healing through the arts and also healing performing artists, both kind of both both directions. But um, at Houston Methodist, um, one of the one of the people he was playing for, um, actually before earlier in the day, um, a physical therapist was working with a patient, and and the the patient mentioned. Um, you know, Yo Yo, -Yo Ma is going to come play a concert for me later today, and and the physical therapist not being advised about the program wrote in apparently wrote in the chart um, patient having possible delusional episodes um, until later in the day when oh okay <laughs> apparently Yo Yo Ma is here in the hospital digitally playing concerts, um, so that was it was just one of one of the kind of like million bizarre and incredible stories that came out of this this. Um, program and and there have been almost a thousand sessions just in the last year and change with the vital sounds program we've reached 5,000 individual patients um the artists have played it, I, we're learning how to to, to um, track metrics there, there's been over 50,000 minutes of music played for patients um, across the country um and then we also have a comment section for the musicians and and they the they range from um, you know, this, this patient was um, very tired, but also in pain and this put her, you know, kind of wrote stuff to, to incredibly moving um, testimonials from, from patients saying, I can't, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, 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 very in, intense personal things, um, which it just won't translate with me saying, saying it out loud, but it, anyway. Um, so at this moment, I just want to give everyone a reminder that you can ask Andrew, we're going to have a Q&A after this. So if you have questions for Andrew, you can put them in the Q&A area. There's a little um, icon with looks like two conversation squares at the bottom of your Zoom panel that you can put a, a, a question in the chat and we'll ask let answer, uh, Andrew ask the, answer those at the end. But you know, this brings up another point, which is, well, first of all, I have a question about how many times do you think that Yo-Yo's played for Project Music? How many concerts has he done under that? Oh, uh, I mean, he, he himself has done, I believe, um, six, six full sessions, and each session is about two hours long. Um, and so I, he's, he's reached over 50 individual patients throughout all this, this wow. time himself. Um, and, and a lot of those are, we have, so the Vital Sounds Initiative, um, it, it's being led by Project Music Heals Us. There's actually a, a network of arts organizations who Project Music Heals Us is facilitating um, paying the artists um, of those organizations to give hospitals uh, uh, these kinds of concerts in, in their own localities. Um, because you know, before the pandemic, Project Music Heals us had never played a concert in Houston or San Diego or right. Seattle or anywhere. So, and and we just didn't know early early on in the pandemic, like where is this program going? We don't want this to just be a flash in the pan and then and then all of a sudden, um, you know, back to normal. Um, so we really wanted to reach reach arts organizations who we both knew and who we didn't know, and so we opened an application portal so that um, we could kind of redirect some of this support that had come through this very positive press cycle um, towards people in the trenches doing incredible work. And there, there's a groups in San Antonio called Hearts Need Art, Salestina right in Los Angeles, um, the American Modern Opera Company, um, all just doing incredible work with this program. But you're the facilitator for all, it goes through Project Music Heals Us pretty much. Yeah, enough. so we're, we're aiming to build an entire nationwide network of, of these kinds of digital one-on-one -on -one healing concerts for isolated patients. And, and that's, that, that is not going anywhere after the pandemic is long and, and they, there, there will always be people in psychiatric care, in high-risk birth units, in uh, neuro ICUs with risk of brain infection. There, there are people who are very alone in, in hospital wow. situations. And, and these concerts are one of the few things that the healthcare workers have told us have been almost universally appreciated by by patients. That's beautiful. Are they mostly classical concerts? Is there other genres of music that are going into these areas as well? I know that's a great question. So we, we Project Music Heals Us was was born as a classical music organization, um, but in in all and especially maybe 
um, the Vital Sounds Initiative, we, we really wanted to, to kind of honor this notion of preferential music, um, which is we're not coming to force this music, which is the best on you, because first of all, that's not what we believe. Like music is great in, across all genres at, at its highest level. Um, and, and also, um, you know, even within every genre, you have so many different moods of music. So you can, you can use classical music to excite, you can use classical music to relax, you can do the same with rock, you can do the same with hip hop, you can do. So we've, we've really followed the expertise of each of the, the Vital Sounds organization, um, organizations that we've been working with, with San Antonio, for, for example, um, they have a singer songwriter on guitar who's incredible. Um, they don't do classical music, but that doesn't matter. Their, their, their music is incredible and we're not gonna try and like make them fit in our square box. And even within P PMHU concerts, we've had Broadway singers, we've had um, Brazilian jazz pianists, we've had, um, yeah, it's, it, there, there have been any number of, of different genres within these yeah. programs. And, and they are, our only criteria is, are you like truly dedicated and excellent at your craft? Um, Right. And, uh, you know, there have been no complaints on that, on that end. Wonderful. Well, I know that on your website, that beautiful video where Yo-Yo Ma is actually asking for musicians during this time to join the Vital Sounds Initiative is, it's incredible. Um, very yeah, we, about working we wish we had, oh, sorry. That's okay. I was just going to say he's, he's very passionate about working with you. So he truly believes in what you're doing. He's incredible. I mean, just, I, I don't think there's a man or woman in the world who, who doesn't meet him and come away inspired to do whatever they're doing better and higher and, and with more compassion. Um, and and to, to, his, to his point, we had over 500 musicians reach out um, when the Times piece ran. And we were scrambling to find places for them. There just wasn't nearly enough capacity. We couldn't expand fast enough um, in a responsible manner. Um, and over the course of the year, we've actually had 190 different artists participate in, in these concerts. Um, and honestly, like it feels like the tip of the iceberg. Like it, it feels like we are barely scratching the surface. Um, but yeah, everything, everything requires um, kind of thoughtful, thoughtful planning and and a lot of a lot of fundraising. So, yes, I can imagine. But you know, it's a beautiful thing that you know it's 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 the odd silver lining that has happened out of the pandemic, which is there's so many of these beautiful initiatives that have been launched that probably will not go away that are going to benefit lives moving forward, and this is one of them. I yeah, I mean, I know that uh, Molly just went and saw a friend of hers perform a concert um, in, in a, a storefront. They had, oh, wow. they had the, he's inside playing and they have mic'd him and put a, a very like beautiful PA system out onto the street. So wow. people walking by are, are just serenaded and like, that's awesome. It's in New York City. People are just like, what is happening over there? Well, the um, beautiful thing is that that's gonna provide also a lot more jobs for musicians, which is so needed, especially now. Yeah, no, I, I, musicians are nothing if not um, ingenuous or what, whatever the word is, you know, <laughs> they, if, if they're, yeah, if there, if there is a, a way to, to create kind of beautiful situations to connect people, like musicians will be the ones to do it. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. I wish it had been easier, but um, I'm not surprised to see all of these kind of incredible, as you say, silver linings that have popped up. And I think a lot of them are yeah. here to stay and it's, would, it's the best. So, you know, you through Project Music Heals, Heals Us, you've been providing this incredible solace and beauty in the face of a lot of pain for a lot of different people. So I wanna hear, tell us about that experience for you as musicians. I mean, what have you learned and what is it like to be at the bedside of someone? You've mentioned it a little bit, but what's the personal feeling for you and what have you learned as an individual because of that? Sure. So, um, you know, you start, you start as a musician, you start practicing, practicing, practicing with the notion that you're gonna get hired for concerts. And then from there, you're gonna get hired for bigger audiences and better halls and more money. And, um, 
and you're kind of on this path, even kind of no matter what genre, no matter what, you're you're on this path. And when when the pandemic hit and all of that was taken away, I mean the financial hit was was catastrophic for for so many people. But again, this notion that all of a sudden this one thing that that people have been honing their entire lives to share themselves through music, that that was taken away. Um, people were going a little nuts. Like they were, you know, they were practicing to try and to try and like keep the level up and with the notion that, okay, this is not gonna be forever. But day after day, just trying to practice for the sake of practicing um, is brutal. And, and so we, we felt very, very fortunate to be able to provide these, these um, opportunities for people to connect. And, and you know, it's, it's a digital medium. We're, we're talking in a webinar right now. I can't see the people we're talking to. Um, it is a, an innately impersonal um, kind, of, kind of medium in that way. But when you're talking about these kinds of concerts that we're giving, um, it's actually completely the opposite. Um, like when, when you're playing for one single person, especially after you used to trying to play for more and more people in bigger halls, and then all of a sudden it's just you on this side and a face looking at you who is usually in some amount of distress. Um, it, it feels so, so like just like the, the responsibility is so heavy. Um, and sometimes it's people, you know, eating lunch and having a good time and, and it's, you know, you're having fun, you're playing. And other times you can just see that like people are just barely, barely able to hold, hold it together. Um, and, and so you, you, you're playing these concerts and it's this feeling of like, I have to play my best right now. Like this is so, it's so imperative that, that I, I give my all right now. And yeah, it's a digital medium and yeah, it's a tablet and yes, I'm playing into a computer. But on the other hand, it's like, usually there's like a hundred feet between me and the first audience member on a stage. In this case, like this, these iPads are like often like in bed with people. Like it's like they're they're holding it while they're you know laying there, and it's like on some level, it's it's yeah, it's digital and virtual, but it's so personal. Um, I, I played a concert last week for for a woman, and you know, I, I she I <laughs> I know this woman had never been to a classical music concert. Like it was just like very clear from the first note, but. Um, but she was having a good time and I was having a good time. And then the last piece she asked me to play was the Marine hymn, which I kind of knew, like, it was like, you know, it's like, it's in my head, but she, she's, she's like, yeah, you, if you can play it for me, that'd be great. And so I just click, 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 found the sheet music. And, and, you know, I'm, I, we practice sight reading a lot. So I, I played it for her and, and afterwards she like just started to tear up and she was in her 80s and she said you know my brother my brother passed in Vietnam he was 21 years old he was in the Marines wow. um, and it was just like it was so incredible to me that we're talking decades and decades and decades later that this piece of music was her connection over the course of over a half century to her her brother who she still felt very close to um and that I came in from New York playing into Michigan to bring this piece of music to her. Um, it was, it was, yeah, I mean, you just never get those kinds of, of reactions in, in a concert hall. So yeah, all that's to say, it's, it's a digital platform, it's a virtual platform, but that doesn't mean it can't be like in, intensely personal. Beautiful, that's amazing. So do you, and that was, that was incredible. You've talked about the personal moments now in COVID. So do you have any personal moving moments that came out of the prison ministry that, that you've done prison music as well? Yeah, I more more than I could share in the time we have. Um, you, we, we were talking about this a couple of days ago, kind of getting ready for this. And I was, I was thinking about what, which ones were kind of the most appropriate to share. And, and there was one actually, the, the second, concert we ever gave in a correctional setting was, um, it was at a, a maximum security, the, the most maximum security that we were able to, to get into. There, there are levels beyond which they don't do any programming. Um, but going into that, that institution, like right through the porthole felt very different. Like just the, the, the level of like, yeah, it just the, the air was different. It was 
anyway, so we, we went up and that concert was in the school within the prison. And we, it was one of these concerts, it was like four hours away in Connecticut. We woke up at like 4.30 in the morning to drive up from New York, tired, confused, like, and then all of a sudden, like just a very, very intense feeling in the room because it was now eight something in the morning. Um, and so we started playing a Haydn quartet, um, not a difficult piece, like a, just kind of, you play it, it's pretty, it's a good way to start a concert. And we just fell off the, the, the train. Like we, it, it was a just crash landing, no, no fixing it. And so we like, what happened? And, and so one of the violinists um, stood up and she said, look, it's really early in the morning. Um, we're really sorry. We really want to bring you like the best of what we have. Do you, do you mind if we just like start, start again from the top? Um, and right from the back of the room, you know, and, and it was like the way they set up the room even felt like, you know, we're over here and they're over there. And, um, and some guy from the back is like, yeah, do your thing, man. <laughs> and, and then someone from the front is like, yeah, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but it was just like the, the glass was broken. All of a sudden it was just a bunch of people like enjoying music. We played through it again, the talk, talk, talk. Like it was a great concert. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know if we played great, but it was a great experience. Um, and after that concert, um, one of the guys came up to me in particular, I was, I was packing up um, and he, he came to me particularly because I was the cellist and he said that um, just before he had been sent, sent up, um, his niece had started to play the cello. And it was really like awesome for him to see her like starting to like get creative on an instrument. And it was like just nagging at him that he couldn't be there to see that progression. Um, and we talked, you know, we talked a little cello, we talked whatever. And then after, after we kind of finished talking, he, he started to kind of like well up a little bit. And uh, so, I mean, so did I. Um, but he kind of like excused himself to go sit sit for a minute and like compose himself. And then they all left. Um, and this woman who was the principal of the school within the prison came up to us and, and told me, like, Are you, you know, I don't know what you said to him, but that, that guy hasn't said anything to anyone since he got here, like, you know, a month ago. Um, and it was, it was just one of these moments where I, I was like, oh my God, I'm glad I didn't know that like before, beforehand. Um, but yeah, music, music, even classical music, which I'm almost sure was not his like preferred genre, like um, gave him space to talk about things that he definitely wouldn't have talked to some random, random stranger about. Um, and that was, I, I felt very, very lucky to have just, you know, it's this wood box. It's just this stupid wood box that people make, and like, but you you use it, and then it kind of breaks down these walls. Um, and yeah, so we we just keep we keep having very very fortunate um, encounters like that, and I think it it keeps us inspired to keep trying to to you know push that oh. rock up the hill. Right. Wow. Well, we do have some questions for you, Andrew. Are you ready for that? We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of questions here. Um, one of them is, have you done or are you thinking of any studies on improving blood pressure or monitoring of patients of pa or patient vitals? Have you collected patient testimonials? And it's, they say, thank you for your great work. I, I love that question so much. Um, yes, it's all I think about all day long. Um, there, there was actually an IRB written to actually take blood draws and study um, the effects of uh, digital concert interventions like we do um, on like cytokine levels. I think it was interleukin six, like all, all this stuff that I don't know anything about, but um, that, that one is at the very early stages of happening. In the meantime, there is a cohort on the East Coast um, that is setting up at University of Michigan, um, University of Rochester, uh, two other hospitals, which I will name once they're absolutely committed, um, to do to do um, surveys, patient surveys on pain, sleep quality, um, stress, anxiety, all of this. There's another one at University of California, San Diego, um, that's going to actually use Indian classical music and Western classical music 
um, to do similar but slightly different studies. Um, yeah, we're I am I am very very passionate about um, trying to to track the impact of these concerts beyond just kind of anecdotal. Um, you know, the, the stories are so great and they're real, and what we hear from the healthcare workers is you know qualitative and, and amazing. Um, but there are a lot of people who just see these programs as like, oh, that's nice. Wow. So until you can actually like show that, oh, they didn't need as many like anti-anxiety drugs because they had a concert instead, um, until until you can like actually show that kind of thing, then then you're going to have a lot of uh, difficult discussions with insurers and hospitals and foundations and, and things. So we are very committed to kind of the long haul of of really, really rigorously proving that these concerts do what everybody That's says beautiful. they do. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, music truly is healing. That's to, to quantify it. I mean, I, and, and I should I should say we didn't invent the idea of, of tracking this. There have been so many studies on the effects of music in in healthcare, and and I mean, I think the the question is settled. Like, it is absolutely a tool that should be used in healthcare. Um, the the difference being now with virtual kind of virtual live um, interventions for people who can't access the the actual in-person live um, does that have the same kind of efficacy and and I I would purport that it does um, and I, I look forward to be proven right definitely because that makes it accessible to many 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 more people yeah. that kind of healing balm yeah so there's another question here which is, do you have any registered board certified music therapists on your board as mentors? As a former RMT slash BC, I worked in hospitals, hospice, private clients, et cetera, and witnessed the same incredible physiological responses from patients that hadn't spoken in years. I congratulate you on your initiative and work. Yeah, I, I want to say the also great questions. Um, so we, we, we try and be very, um, uh, clear and honoring of the work of music therapists. Um, it, it is a very specific kind of work that they do. They're there for long periods of time. The training is intensive, um, and and what they what they do is highly specialized. Um, we at Project Music Heals us were kind of thrown into this um, by the pandemic. So what what we do. As of now, and and who knows? I, I would love to see it expand at some point if if that makes sense with the program. Um, we're we're doing live music interventions, um, and just the difference being that we we see a patient for a session, um, and then for for any number of reasons, you know, sometimes we do actually have repeat repeat um, engagements, but um, often often it's kind of one one time is because then a patient will get moved or released. Um, music therapists are, are just so incredible with working with the same patients for, for lengths of time. So um, we've talked with a lot of music therapists as this, um, as this course has um, developed. None are on our board, but we do have, we do have um, a number who we trust inherently and, and we, we rely on them for a lot of kind of best practices. Um, thank you for what you do. Oh, beautiful. Well, you are getting some also in the Q and A some some kudos and thanks for what you are doing, Andrew. Um, so, thank you. Um, at this point, do you have anything more? Let's see, we have a little bit more time, but do you have anything more to add, Andrew? It's it's just so nice to to see you and get to to speak at these programs. Thank you so much for having having me. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been incredible to hear the deeper issues of, that you're dealing with and just the beauty, the, the amazing um, experience that you've had in bringing this and the healing that it's doing. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you for all you're doing. Seriously, thank you. It's, it's, you know, it's amazing how it's grown and obviously the need is there. It's expanding. Good for you. Good for you. Um, so... If there aren't any more questions, um, I would like to, I know that Andrew, you wanted to finish with, a song, with some music for us, right? Um, it's, always, it's always more fun to end with music. Okay, so let me just say to everyone that I thank you all for coming. Uh, look for a follow-up email with the recording of this presentation. You will get one from us. The link for the uh, cello piano concert 
and Yamaha screening of the documentary on April 25th will be included in that email. And um, Andrew, the other thing is that Andrew and the Project Heals, Music Heals Us musicians will also be playing at Soka Performing Arts Center on February 12, 2022 as well. That information will be on our website uh, coming up once we announce our, 20, our 22 season. But I do appreciate everyone being here. I think it's been a wonderful thing to hear what's really been going on and how we, um, I think a lot of us have heard a little bit about this, but to hear from the musicians who've done it, it's, it's a wonderful personal thing and it's just been beautiful. So thank you all for attending. Renee, I'm going to, um, if you can riff for 30 more seconds, um, I can fix my camera. <laughs> Absolutely, because I almost, I'm glad actually, because I was remembering that. I wanted to remind everyone that we also have um, on our website, we are going to be having a lot more of these, these virtual offerings, some of which are musical and some of which are like this, which are talking about things that a lot of musicians are doing a little bit more outside the box. We've got some wonderful jazz interviews on that website as well. So um, please check it out. It's, you know, www.soka.edu slash PAC. So thank you. <clears throat> and also we have the PMHU website, which is pmhu.org, if you find, want to find out more about what Andrew is doing in the Vital Sounds Initiative as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. 